In the summer of 2022, a quiet suburb of Lafayette, Louisiana, is shaken by the sudden and mysterious disappearance of Malcolm Williams, a 19-year-old who vanishes without a trace. His girlfriend, Kesha Brown, is frantic when Malcolm doesn't return home after a night out. His phone is off, and his car is found abandoned on a deserted road. The police launch an investigation, but each clue only leads to more questions. Behind this disappearance lies not just a family secret, it's the beginning of a dark and destructive story. What happened to Malcolm? Something far more terrifying than a simple romance lurks in the shadows. Candace Brown had always seemed like the perfect wife and mother. At 42, she lives with her husband Lamar Brown in the Lafayette suburbs, where their family is well respected in the community. Candace leads the typical life of a housewife, taking care of the home and supporting her husband, who works at a local construction company. However, beneath the surface of this seemingly perfect life, Candace harbors deep feelings of dissatisfaction and longing for her lost youth. Lamar, a calm and even-tempered man, works late and is often too tired to pay attention to his wife. Their marriage, once full of love and passion, has settled into a routine, leaving Candace trapped in a cycle of emptiness. Their 18-year-old daughter, Kesha Brown, is preparing to leave for college. She is ambitious and intelligent, eagerly anticipating the new life that awaits her outside the small town. Her relationship with 19-year-old Malcolm Williams seems perfect. Malcolm is confident, a promising college student who already works part-time to save money for his future business. His charm and ambition have made him popular not just with his peers, but with Kesha's parents, who see him as a bright future for their daughter. But Malcolm has a secret that threatens to shatter this picture-perfect relationship. He's secretly involved with Candace, Kesha's mother. What begins as innocent flirting spirals into something much more? Candace, seeing in Malcolm the youth, passion, and energy missing from her marriage, doesn't immediately grasp where it will lead. Malcolm, on the other hand, finds himself caught in a complex and morally ambiguous relationship. This secret affair threatens not only his relationship with Kesha but also his entire life. Tension within the family slowly but inevitably begins to build. Malcolm, torn between his passion for Candace and his attachment to Kesha, becomes increasingly distant. He spends less time with his girlfriend, avoids discussions about the future, and even cancels plan dates. Kesha, intuitive and sensitive, starts noticing the odd changes in Malcolm's behavior. He has become withdrawn, his answers shorter, and the easygoing charm that once attracted her has faded. Meanwhile, Candace finds more and more reasons to be near Malcolm. She makes up excuses to see him, whether it's running into him at the store or needing help with something around the house. They meet in secret at places where no one should see them, but each time their passion becomes harder to hide. Kesha soon starts to feel that something is off. It's not just Malcolm's behavior that worries her, but her mother's strange actions as well. Candace becomes more irritable, frequently leaving the house for vague reasons and avoiding conversations with both Lamar and Kesha, claiming she's just tired. Kesha notices more and more how often her mother and Malcolm end up in the same places, and their fleeting glances grow increasingly meaningful. Suspicion begins to creep into Kesha's mind, but she can't fully accept the possibility that her mother and Malcolm could be involved with each other. As the family remains in a state of hidden tension, the secret meetings between Candace and Malcolm become increasingly risky. The tension between them, initially purely physical, deepens into an emotional connection and a psychological game. By deceiving both Kesha and Lamar, they realize they have risked much more than they expected. Candace and Malcolm's relationship grows more intense, their passion starts to cloud their judgment. Candace feels more alive than she has in years, while Malcolm, despite his overwhelming guilt toward Kesha, continues to fall into her mother's manipulative web. He knows he's in too deep, and there's no way out without destroying everything. He has, each time, promised himself it will be their last meeting, but once again, he finds himself in Candace's arms, captivated by her intensity and promises. Candace, knowing Malcolm is torn between her and her daughter, begins to pressure him more. She tells him their affair is her only chance at happiness, that Lamar hasn't loved or noticed her for a long time. She convinces Malcolm that he is her salvation, her future. Candace manipulates his fears and doubts, urging him to leave Kesha for their relationship. She believes Malcolm can only be happy with her and becomes consumed by her obsession, no longer seeing any boundaries. However, Malcolm, feeling the rising tension, starts thinking more and more about ending things with Candace but fears the consequences. His life is filled with too many secrets, and he begins to realize he's gone too far. 
This is no longer just an affair, it's become his personal trap. Malcolm starts avoiding Kesha, spending less time with his friends, haunted by the situation but unable to break free from the vicious cycle. It's at this moment that everything takes an unexpected turn. One night, after yet another secret meeting with Candace, Malcolm suddenly disappears. Candace was the last person to see him alive. They had met at a hidden apartment outside of town, discussing the future of their relationship. Malcolm appeared tense and depressed, telling Candace that he couldn't continue living like this and that he wanted to tell Kesha the truth. But Candace, sensing the threat to their secret, convinced him to stay a little longer. The next morning, Kesha grows worried. Malcolm isn't answering his phone or texts. She calls his friends and family, but no one knows where he is. Hours later, the police receive a report of an abandoned car on a deserted road outside of town. It's Malcolm's car, but he's nowhere to be found. There are no signs of a struggle in the car, but the doors are open and the key is still in the ignition. The police begin investigating his disappearance. Detectives arrive at the scene, carefully examining the car and the surrounding area. However, no clues reveal what happened. Questioning neighbors and witnesses leads nowhere. No one saw where Malcolm went. Kesha is in a panic. She doesn't understand what's happening and starts to suspect that his disappearance might be linked to her mother. She notices Candace acting strangely. Her mother seems nervous and avoids questions about Malcolm, even though she had appeared fond of him just recently. At the same time, Lamar, her father, is absorbed in his work and doesn't notice that something is wrong within the family. Malcolm's disappearance becomes a true mystery for the police. It doesn't seem like a typical runaway case. The young man had plans for his future and no known enemies, yet the clues point to something much more complex and dark. As the investigation unfolds, details begin to emerge that no one expected, and the truth behind Malcolm's disappearance is yet to be uncovered. After Malcolm's car was found abandoned on a deserted road, the police began digging deeper into his circle. Initial interviews with friends and family led nowhere, but soon the detective's attention shifted to the Brown family. Candace's particularly strange behavior and her attempts to avoid questions about her last encounter with Malcolm raised suspicions. She claimed to know nothing about his disappearance and insisted that she hadn't seen him for several days. However, her nervousness and evasive answers prompted the police to investigate further. At the same time, Lamar Brown, who was initially not considered a suspect, also became a person of interest. Though there was no direct evidence linking him to Malcolm's disappearance, detectives started suspecting that the family might be hiding deeply buried issues that could have led to a tragedy. None of the Browns seemed sincere, and the police began to suspect that family conflicts might have been at the root of Malcolm's disappearance. The police discovered several clues suggesting that Malcolm wasn't alone on the night he went missing. Neighbors mentioned seeing Candace's car near the location where Malcolm's vehicle was found, heightening suspicions about her involvement. Kesha, already under immense stress due to her boyfriend's disappearance, started searching for answers herself. Her confusion intensified as she noticed her mother behaving more and more suspiciously. Candace became increasingly evasive, and Kesha decided to check her mother's phone, a turning point in the story. On the phone, she found messages between Candace and Malcolm that revealed a shocking truth. Her mother and Malcolm had been in a secret relationship. This discovery left Kesha stunned. The messages contained not only intimate confessions but also evidence that the relationship had been going on for a long time. They discussed their future and how difficult it was to keep their affair hidden from Kesha and Lamar. This revelation shattered everything Kesha thought she knew about her mother and Malcolm. She realized her mother had been manipulating her boyfriend and that Candace might even be responsible for his disappearance. In one of the messages from the night Malcolm went missing, Candace hinted at meeting him at a safe place where they could talk without being seen. The police, continuing their investigation, tracked down the location of this safe spot mentioned in the messages, a remote abandoned warehouse outside of town. At the warehouse, they found signs of a struggle, broken items, blood stains on the floor, and shattered glass. The location was quickly classified as a crime scene. Blood tests confirmed that the blood belonged to Malcolm, complicating the case further. Meanwhile, Kesha, in shock after discovering the messages, confronted her mother. At first, Candace denied everything, but under pressure, she began to reveal parts of the truth. She tried to shift the blame onto Malcolm, claiming that he had threatened to expose their affair to Lamar and Kesha. She said she had tried to end the relationship, but Malcolm refused and became aggressive. However, Kesha, 
now fully aware of her mother's cruelty and manipulation, didn't believe a word. She started to suspect that Candace wasn't just involved in Malcolm's disappearance but could also be responsible for his death. Everything pointed to Candace being directly linked to his fate. Candace realized that her secret was on the verge of being exposed. Panic set in as the police intensified their focus on her. She tried to erase all traces that could tie her to Malcolm's disappearance. She quickly deleted all the messages on her phone and destroyed any evidence that might link her to him. She also secretly got rid of the clothes she had worn on the night Malcolm disappeared and cleaned her car to remove any possible traces, hoping it would protect her. Simultaneously, Candace attempted to convince Kesha that she had nothing to do with Malcolm's disappearance. In a desperate bid to regain control, she began manipulating her daughter, playing on her emotions. She begged Kesha to believe that the entire situation was just a horrible misunderstanding, that she didn't know where Malcolm was, and that it was all a coincidence. But Kesha, knowing about the secret affair, could no longer trust her mother. Every time Candace tried to justify herself, Kesha could see through the lies. Soon, detectives uncovered more evidence tying Candace to the disappearance. They found security camera footage showing Candace's car leaving town the night Malcolm went missing, headed toward the abandoned warehouse, the site where signs of a struggle and Malcolm's blood were found. The police now suspected that Candace was not only involved in his disappearance but might also be implicated in his murder. Additionally, new evidence pointed to Candace attempting to frame Lamar, her husband, by planting his documents in Malcolm's car, making him seem like a suspect and diverting attention away from herself. The investigation reached its climax with a tragic discovery. Malcolm's body was found in the woods near the warehouse, and the police confirmed that he had been brutally murdered, with evidence showing multiple blows from a blunt object inflicted in a fit of rage. This added a new layer of cruelty and fury to the case, indicating that the killer had acted not in cold calculation but under intense emotional strain. With this revelation, the police continued gathering evidence, closing in on Candace. Time was running out for her. When investigators presented her with the facts, surveillance footage, fingerprints, and blood evidence, Candace realized that her arrest was inevitable. Kesha, despite her own personal shock and grief, found herself in a difficult position. She had to decide whether to support her mother or become a witness against her in court. Kesha was torn between two powerful emotions, her love for her mother and her desire for justice for Malcolm's death. She knew she couldn't turn a blind eye to what had happened and that her mother had committed a terrible crime. In a final confrontation just before her arrest, Candace still tried to justify herself. She claimed it had been an accident, that Malcolm had threatened her, and she had acted in self-defense. But all the evidence in her own actions pointed to something else. At the trial, her attempts to evade punishment crumbled against the overwhelming facts. Malcolm's blood on her clothing, the evidence at the crime scene, and her efforts to manipulate the situation by framing Lamar. For Kesha, the trial became a moment of truth, where she was forced to testify against her mother. In the end, she chose justice and truth, even though it meant losing her mother forever. After Malcolm's body was found and the mounting evidence against Candace, her arrest became inevitable. As the shocking news spread through local media, Lafayette buzzed with rumors about the once-respected housewife now implicated in a gruesome murder. Neighbors, acquaintances, and even relatives struggled to believe what had happened, and the tension in the town grew more intense. The police meticulously gathered evidence, including surveillance footage, fingerprints, text messages, and photos from phones. They also turned to Kesha, who, despite her internal turmoil, chose to testify against her mother. Her testimony became a pivotal moment in the case, providing clarity on Candace's motives and plans. The trial began several months after Candace's arrest. The press closely followed the case, discussing its shocking details. In the courtroom, tension was high. On one side, Malcolm's relatives sought justice, and on the other, Candace's family, including her husband Lamar, who felt betrayed, still struggled to believe his wife was capable of such a crime. During the trial, the prosecutor presented the evidence with cold clarity. The first to testify was a detective who detailed the investigation and how the evidence led to Candace. He explained how her car had been captured on surveillance cameras the night Malcolm disappeared. Then, the prosecutor presented the autopsy report, which revealed that Malcolm had died from multiple blows with a blunt object. Experts testified that the attack had been carried out under extreme emotional stress, suggesting a crime of passion. Key evidence was also presented, the messages found on Kesha and Candace's phones. 
These messages revealed the details of their secret affair and showed how Candace had tried to manipulate the situation, tearing her family apart. Bloodstains and fingerprints found at the warehouse matched Candace, placing her at the center of the charges. The trial's climax came when Kesha took the stand. Sitting as a witness, she couldn't hold back her tears. Her voice trembled as she recounted how her mother had led a double life, betraying her trust. Kesha described her suspicions, the tension in her relationship with Malcolm, and how she discovered the affair. She openly spoke about how her mother had planned to frame Lamar, putting him under police scrutiny. This revelation shocked the courtroom, including Lamar, who sat in disbelief. Candace's defense attorney tried to portray her as a woman under emotional pressure, driven mad by passion and the fear of losing love. However, her manipulative actions, lies, and attempts to frame her own husband undermined this defense. After several days of testimony, the jury withdrew to deliberate. The wait was agonizing for both sides, but after only a few hours, the jury returned to the courtroom. The atmosphere was thick with tension as everyone awaited the final decision. When the judge read the verdict, the courtroom fell silent. Candace Brown was found guilty of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The verdict brought a sense of closure for Malcolm's family, but for Kesha, it marked the end of her former life. She felt empty, having lost both her mother and the man she loved. For Kesha, the trial was not only about justice but also a personal ordeal. She knew her mother would spend the rest of her life in prison for the terrible crime, but it brought no relief. The sense of betrayal and loss would haunt her forever. Lamar, having lost both his wife and his faith in family, decided to leave Lafayette and start a new life far from the nightmare that had turned his world upside down. The trial concluded, leaving deep emotional scars on Kesha, wounds she would carry for a long time. Immediately after the verdict, Kesha's life changed drastically. Lafayette, once her home, now symbolized only pain, betrayal, and tragedy. She decided to move to another city, hoping to leave the past behind. However, this was easier said than done. Every step forward was difficult. Memories of Malcolm, her mother, and everything that had happened became an inescapable part of her life. From the very first days in her new city, Kesha struggled with anxiety and guilt. She often woke up in the middle of the night from nightmares, reliving moments from her last conversation with Malcolm and the confrontation with her mother. These thoughts deepened her emotional wounds. She felt alone and abandoned, unable to trust people again. Any kind of relationship, whether friendship or romantic, seemed unbearably difficult to her. Kesha sought solace in therapy over the next few months. She attended sessions with a psychologist, taking steps toward healing. The therapist helped her understand that she wasn't responsible for her mother's actions and that her pain and betrayal were the consequences of other people's choices. Yet, despite this, Kesha still struggled to accept the fact that her mother had been capable of such cruelty. Kesha also faced constant public attention. Even in a different city, her family story had become a topic of discussion in the press and among acquaintances. People didn't always know her personally, but they remembered her last name and her tragic story. This made it difficult for her to fully integrate into society and start fresh. Years passed, and despite the challenges, Kesha continued fighting for a normal life. She enrolled in university, started working, and tried to create an illusion of normalcy. But one day, something unexpected happened. On an ordinary day, as Kesha returned home, she found an envelope with no return address in her mailbox. The letter contained no signature or detailed information about the sender. There were only a few lines hinting that the events surrounding Malcolm's murder and Candace's trial were just part of a larger mystery. You think you know the truth, but what happened was only the beginning. Look closely into your family's past and you'll find more than you want to know. These words sent a chill down Kesha's spine. The letter implied that other people were involved, manipulating the situation, perhaps someone from her mother's past or even Malcolm's. Kesha had no idea who could have written the message or what secrets were still hidden behind those words, but she couldn't ignore this warning. The psychological pressure she had just begun to overcome returned with full force. She couldn't leave this letter unanswered. Kesha decided that she needed to continue investigating to uncover what secrets her family was hiding and who else might have been involved in the tragic events that had destroyed her life. Perhaps Kesha stood on the brink of new revelations that would once again append her reality, forcing her to look at everything from a different perspective. Springfield, Vermont, was like a picture-perfect postcard, 
a quiet, cozy town where everyone knew each other and each day seemed to blend seamlessly into the next. Springfield was a place where time appeared to have stopped, preserving the ideal of the small American dream. Among the neat houses with well-kept lawns and white picket fences stood the Bennett family home on one of the town's most prestigious streets. Robert Bennett, the head of the family, was a respected businessman. He had built his construction company from the ground up, turning it into one of the most successful in the county. At 50, Robert was a man who embodied discipline and perseverance. His reputation as a man of his word made him not only successful but also revered in the community. Sarah Bennett, his wife, was a beloved teacher at the local school. At 48, her kindness and compassion were undiminished. She always knew how to connect with each student, and her classes were highly sought after. Sarah was the heart of the family, always supporting her children and husband, ensuring that their home remained a place of comfort and peace. Thomas and Emily, the Bennett children, seemed like the perfect teenagers. Thomas had just turned 18 and was preparing to attend college, planning to follow in his father's footsteps in business. Emily, a 16-year-old with a bright and talented disposition, dreamed of becoming an artist and often secluded herself in her room, painting her emotions and feelings on canvas. But behind this picture-perfect family facade lay a secret that threatened to destroy everything that seemed so flawless. Thomas and Emily, who had grown up side by side, had always been close. Their bond, initially innocent and childlike, had begun to take on darker forms over time. Thomas, usually calm and composed, had always been the dependable older brother, but in recent years his feelings toward Emily started to change. He found it increasingly difficult to see her as just a little sister, a feeling that grew in his heart and both frightened and burdened him, yet he couldn't fight it. He began to notice that his thoughts about her were becoming obsessive, and attempts to drown them out with schoolwork and sports only deepened his inner conflict. On her part, Emily began to sense something unusual in Thomas's behavior. She couldn't understand why he had become so distant and withdrawn or why his eyes sometimes held a strange glint when they were alone. At times, she caught herself realizing that her feelings toward him exceeded the boundaries of typical sibling affection. Her teenage emotions, fueled by her passion for artistic self-expression, only amplified her confusion. She painted images where her feelings for Thomas were hidden beneath layers of symbolism and allegory. Their secret connection, which they were afraid even to acknowledge, began to alter their relationship. They increasingly found excuses to be alone, hiding from prying eyes, unaware that their behavior had already begun to attract attention. Evenings when their parents were occupied became moments when they could be together, trying to make sense of their feelings. This connection became a trap from which there was no escape. Their emotions, both terrifying and magnetic, started to tear them apart from within. They couldn't confess their feelings to each other, nor could they break the bond. Each day, they sank deeper into this dark abyss, not realizing that the consequences of their relationship would be catastrophic. In May 2023, Thomas and Emily began spending more time together in secluded places where no one could see them. They started meeting in the woods outside town, venturing further from home so that no one would notice their disappearances. During this time, their bond grew even stronger, and they both knew they were on the brink of something they could no longer control. Thomas tried to find a way out of the situation, contemplating options from leaving home to attempting to suppress his feelings, but each time his thoughts returned to Emily, as if she were his inevitable fate. In June 2023, Emily, feeling that the situation had become unbearable, began writing a diary where she detailed her feelings for her brother. These entries became her only way to express everything she couldn't say out loud. However, the diary, hidden under her pillow, became another link in the chain of events leading to tragedy. In July 2023, the secret meetings continued, and the tension grew. Detective Julia Harper entered their lives, noticing the strange behavior of Thomas and Emily. She instinctively felt that something was amiss in this family and began her own investigation, suspecting that something much darker lurked behind the facade of this perfect family. The moment was approaching when the illusion of the perfect family would shatter, exposing a tragedy that no one could have predicted. Thomas and Emily found themselves trapped in a situation of their own making, and the only way out was through chaos and destruction. Summer 2023 marked a turning point in the lives of Thomas and Emily. In their seemingly peaceful world, the cracks became increasingly apparent. Emily began to suffer from constant feelings of guilt and shame. Every day was a torment for her. The same question repeatedly ran through her mind. How did we get this far? She feared looking her parents in the eye, 
worried that they would see the secret she so carefully concealed. Emily often woke up at night, drenched in cold sweat after nightmares where she saw herself and Thomas standing on the edge of an abyss. She became withdrawn, distancing herself from friends and abandoning her love of painting. At school, her teachers noticed that Emily was losing interest in her studies and often seemed lost in thought, as if completely disconnected from reality. She was no longer the cheerful girl everyone once knew. Thomas, on the other hand, tried to keep himself in check, but his inner demons gradually gained control. He became increasingly irritable and prone to aggression. Thomas started avoiding his father, fearing that he would uncover his feelings. He often spent time alone, lost in dark thoughts about what he and Emily had done. The thought that their bond was not just a mistake, but something much darker and destructive, tormented him. Thomas took longer and longer walks, trying to escape these thoughts, but the voices in his head condemning him for what had happened continued to grow louder. He didn't know how to silence them. Gradually, Thomas began to feel that he was losing control, and the fear of what he might do became his constant companion. Meanwhile, the Bennett's neighbor, Gary, the owner of a small cafe, began to notice the odd behavior of Thomas and Emily. Gary was always a keen observer, and his friendship with Robert Bennett gave him access to the smallest details of the family's life. He had known this family for many years and had always admired their closeness and successes, something was clearly amiss. Gary first sensed something was wrong when he saw Thomas and Emily leaving the house late one evening and heading toward the woods on the outskirts of town. This place was rarely visited, and Gary wondered why they would go there at such a late hour. He tried to dismiss it, but as these walks became more frequent, his concern grew. One evening, as Gary was closing his cafe, he noticed Thomas and Emily sitting by the river in a secluded spot. Their conversation seemed tense, they were speaking in hushed tones, and when Gary tried to approach them to say hello, they quickly stood up and left as if afraid of being seen. This behavior struck Gary as odd, too strange for ordinary teenagers, and it sparked his suspicions. Gary wasn't one to panic easily, but something about Thomas and Emily's behavior troubled him deeply. He started keeping an eye on them, trying to understand what was going on. Each time he saw them leave the house, his concern grew. Gary noticed that their meetings were becoming more frequent and took place in locations where no one could see them. Gradually, paranoia began to take root in Gary's mind. He couldn't stop thinking that these kids were hiding something terrible. He didn't know what to do, whether to share his suspicions with Robert or just leave things as they were, but his own fears and guesses kept building up, turning the peaceful life in the town into a true nightmare. By August 2023, Thomas and Emily began spending more and more time in the woods, avoiding people. They understood that their bond was becoming increasingly dangerous, but they couldn't stop. Gary, struggling with growing anxiety, started to suspect that there was something much darker behind their secret meetings than just youthful mischief. By September 2023, Gary decided that he couldn't stay silent any longer. He reached out to Detective Julia Harper, sharing his observations with her. Julia, who had already suspected that something was wrong in the Bennett family, decided to launch her own investigation. She knew that time was running out and that they needed to act quickly before something irreversible happened. The first cracks in Thomas and Emily's lives marked the beginning of the end. The secret they had so carefully hidden began to surface, threatening to destroy not just their lives but the entire world they knew. By fall 2023, events in Thomas and Emily's lives had begun to unravel their emotional stability completely. Emily, struggling to cope with guilt and her confused feelings toward her brother, decided to try to reconnect with those around her. She started socializing more with her classmates, attempting to distract herself from her inner turmoil. However, her attempts at building connections with others proved futile. Emily couldn't shake the constant feeling that her secret was about to be exposed, that everyone knew what lay behind her smile. This fear destroyed any possibility of normal interaction. Every new acquaintance ended in failure for her. Emily tried to start a relationship with a classmate named Jason, but each of their meetings was filled with awkwardness and underlying anxiety. Her thoughts inevitably returned to Thomas, making it impossible to develop any relationship. Soon, she completely distanced herself from Jason, which only deepened her isolation. Meanwhile, Thomas, seeing that Emily was trying to distance herself from him, sank deeper into his dark thoughts. His obsession with his sister had reached a point where he couldn't think about anything else. Every moment apart from her felt like losing a part of himself. These feelings grew into a fixation that their bond was something special, something they couldn't allow anyone or anything to destroy. 
Gradually, Thomas's obsession began to take on darker forms. He started noticing that Emily was pulling away from him, and this triggered a panic in him. Thomas began acting more aggressively. He would have jealous outbursts when he saw Emily talking to other guys, even if they were just her friends. He became enraged at the mere thought that someone could take his place in his sister's life. Emily tried to calm her brother, explaining that she needed space, that she wanted to be a normal girl and have normal relationships, but Thomas wouldn't accept this. His aggression increasingly turned into emotional manipulation. He started pressuring his sister, convincing her that they couldn't live without each other. He told her that their bond was the only thing that mattered and that no one would ever understand them except themselves. Thomas manipulated Emily, making her believe that their love was unique and that she shouldn't listen to those around her who would never understand them. He insisted that they had to be together at any cost, even if it meant running away and leaving everything behind. These conversations became a nightmare for Emily. She realized that her brother was no longer in control of himself and that the situation was becoming increasingly dangerous. By October 2023, the tension between the siblings had reached its peak. Thomas began stalking Emily, following her wherever she went. He would appear near her school, wait for her outside their home, giving her no moment of peace, and Emily felt trapped without the strength or will to resist. She feared that Thomas was capable of something terrible if she tried to leave. One evening, when their parents were at work, Thomas had another scene. He locked himself in Emily's room with her, refusing to let her out until they talked. His voice had a threatening tone, and Emily realized that he might move from words to actions. Thomas accused her of betrayal, of wanting to leave him alone. He said that if she left, he wouldn't be able to go on living. That night became a turning point for Emily. She understood that she could no longer hide her fear and needed to find a way out of this nightmare. From that moment, their bond fully transformed into a painful knot that tightened more and more. Thomas and Emily, once close, were now prisoners of their own passion and fear. They understood that they were on a path that could only lead to disaster, but neither knew how to stop this relentless process. By November 2023, Emily tried to seek help from her school friend Lisa but couldn't explain what was really happening in her life. The fear of Thomas and the shame of what bound them were too overwhelming. She became even more withdrawn, avoiding any attempts at closeness. Thomas, on the other hand, started making plans for a future where it would be just him and Emily, with no one else. But he already knew that this plan might require extreme measures. The escalation of tension reached its peak, and the tragic path was already set. Thomas and Emily drifted further and further from reality, entangled in their feelings and fears. They stood on the edge of an abyss, and only time would tell who would make the first step towards the inevitable. November 2023, the days were growing shorter, and the tension between Thomas and Emily was growing stronger under the relentless pressure from Thomas. Emily, exhausted by guilt and helplessness, finally agreed to his plan to run away. They began working out the details, filled with fear and uncertainty. Thomas convinced her that the only way to preserve their bond was to leave town and start over, in a place where no one knew them and where they could hide from judgment and the law. The plan was risky and demanded quick action. Thomas meticulously thought through every detail. They would take only the essentials, leave their cell phones behind so they couldn't be tracked, and slip away into the night while their parents were sound asleep. They intended to leave as few traces as possible, ensuring that neither the police nor anyone else could find them. Emily felt the urgency of time slipping away. She constantly looked over her shoulder, convinced that their secret was already out. Every sound in the house, every footstep outside the door made her heart race. Thomas, on the other hand, was growing increasingly aggressive and insistent. He kept pressing that they needed to act immediately, that every minute of delay brought them closer to being exposed. His obsession with saving their forbidden love was only intensifying, the night before their escape arrived faster than they expected. The oppressive silence in the house only heightened their anxiety. They packed their things in complete silence, trying not to make a single sound when suddenly, a floorboard creaked. Thomas and Emily froze. The door to their room flew open, and there stood Robert, their father, his face twisted in confusion and suspicion. He looked at the suitcases and backpacks his children were hastily trying to hide and knew something was wrong. Robert demanded an explanation, his voice growing louder and more threatening. He wanted to know what they were planning, why they were packing in the middle of the night, and what secrets they were hiding. Thomas, gripped by panic, tried to keep his composure, but his desperation grew with each passing second. 
He knew that if Robert found out the truth, it would all be over. His fear of losing Emily, who meant everything to him, overwhelmed him. In that moment, something inside him snapped. A surge of rage consumed Thomas, and in a fit of anger and despair, he grabbed his father by the shoulders and shoved him with force. Robert, caught off guard, lost his balance and fell backward. Time seemed to slow as his body tumbled down the stairs. The dull thud of his head hitting the wooden steps echoed through the house. Emily screamed, but it was more of a rasping sound. She rushed to her father, but it was too late. Robert lay motionless, his eyes open but devoid of life. Emily stared at her father's body, unable to believe what had just happened. Her world collapsed in an instant. She felt the ground give way beneath her feet, and terror consumed her. But instead of panicking, she instinctively knew they had no choice now. Thomas, still in shock, stared at his father, unable to move. Emily, summoning all her strength, grabbed her brother's hand and began urging him to run. Her voice trembled, but there was a steely determination in it. She understood that their lives were now completely shattered, that there was no turning back, and if they didn't leave immediately, they would be caught, and things would end even worse. Thomas, still in a daze, reluctantly agreed. They gathered the remaining items and left the house, leaving behind only death and chaos. The night was dark, the air cold and damp. They raced through the streets, not looking back, not thinking about where they were going. Their hearts were filled with fear and desperation, and ahead of them lay only an unknown, terrifying path. Thus began their flight, fraught with dark foreboding and the inevitable catastrophe that loomed over them. The night, shrouded in darkness and cold, marked the beginning of their frantic escape. On December 10, 2023, Thomas and Emily left the house where tragedy had just occurred, leaving behind everything they knew and loved. Their hearts pounded in unison with their hurried steps, their thoughts tangled in fear and despair. In the darkness of Springfield, they ran, trying to evade the justice that they were now certain would inevitably catch up with them. But the further they went, the more paranoia began to set in. Thomas and Emily could no longer even trust each other. Every step was accompanied by the torturous feeling that someone was watching them, that someone was about to catch them. They avoided crowded places, fearing they would be recognized, and hid in the shadows, where the fear only grew. Around every corner, in every passerby, they saw a threat. They didn't know where to go, had no plan, and most importantly, no idea how to escape the guilt that was slowly eating them alive. Their entire existence became a never-ending flight to nowhere, where reality started to warp and distort under the pressure of fear and horror. Soon, their escape turned into a living nightmare. After days of wandering nameless roads and nights spent in cheap motels, Emily began noticing strange things creeping into her consciousness. She couldn't shake the horrific visions that haunted her at all hours. The scene of her father's death replayed over and over in her mind, his body lying on the floor, blood slowly spreading across the wooden steps, almost as if it were alive. Soon, these visions turned into hallucinations. Her father would rise from the floor, reach out to her, his dead eyes staring into her soul, accusing and cursing her. Thomas was not immune to this madness either. He began hearing his father's voice, stern and full of condemnation. The voice echoed in his head, sometimes growing louder and more insistent. It reproached Thomas, called him a traitor and a murderer, told him that their life was now a punishment for what they had done. Thomas tried to fight it, but the harder he tried, the more the voice took hold of his mind. Soon, Thomas could no longer tell where reality ended and this nightmare began. Paranoia and guilt pulled them into an endless vortex of terror from which there seemed to be no escape. They stopped trusting each other. Every glance, every gesture seemed suspicious. Emily withdrew further into herself, while Thomas began to lose control of his emotions, sinking into a pit of despair and self-destruction. Their physical condition also deteriorated. Endless hours without sleep and the constant fear of being caught led to exhaustion. They could barely eat, could hardly think of anything other than the terror that followed them at every step. Thomas began wasting away, his face gaunt, his eyes hollow and lifeless. Emily didn't look much better. Her once lively face was now pale with dark circles under her eyes, and it seemed she was living on the edge of a nervous breakdown. With each passing day, their flight became more chaotic and desperate. They tried to get as far away as possible from the place where their tragedy began, but the horror kept following them like a shadow. Every night, they woke up in cold sweats, hearing screams and seeing ghostly images in the dark. 
Their minds were torn between the desire to end it all and the fear of the inevitable reckoning. This unbearable reality, where each new day brought more suffering, had turned their lives into an endless nightmare. They no longer lived but merely existed, sinking deeper into the abyss of despair and terror. December 20, 2023, marked the day when Thomas and Emily Bennett's escape reached its dramatic conclusion. After weeks of futile attempts to stay hidden, they found refuge in an old, abandoned house on the outskirts of town. This house, long forgotten and deserted, became their final sanctuary, the place where their mental state reached its breaking point. Detective Linda Morris, known for her sharp mind and keen intuition, had finally tracked them down by piecing together their route through surveillance footage and witness statements. Thomas and Emily, already broken by internal horror and guilt, didn't expect to be found so soon. Morris, arriving at the scene with a team of officers, left them no chance of escape. When the police surrounded the house, Thomas and Emily didn't even try to hide. It was as if they had lost the will to live. Emily, upon seeing the detectives, broke into hysteria, screaming and begging to be left alone. She tried to convince Morris that they were innocent, that it was all some terrible misunderstanding, but her words were incoherent, full of despair and fear, which only solidified the police's belief that they were witnessing a tragic conclusion. Thomas, in contrast, seemed completely detached. He sat on the floor, unresponsive to his sister's cries and the police orders to stand up and surrender. His gaze was empty, and it appeared he had already given up inside. When they lifted him and placed handcuffs on him, he didn't even try to resist. Only a single tear rolled down his cheek as he finally met Linda Morris's eyes, realizing this was the end. After the arrest, when the police began a thorough search of the house, they discovered a small box hidden under old furniture in one of the rooms. Inside were diaries and letters that Thomas and Emily had written to each other over the past several months. These records became key evidence, revealing the dark world in which they had lived. Emily's diary was filled with entries about her internal struggle, the guilt that tore her apart, and the fear that their love would lead to disaster. She described how each day became a trial for her, how she tried to find a way out of the situation. But her feelings for her brother always overpowered her. Her letters to Thomas, full of passion and despair, reflected her helplessness in the face of this forbidden love. Thomas's writings, on the other hand, revealed a different spectrum of emotions. His diary was a testament to his growing obsession with Emily. He detailed his feelings for her, his jealousy of others who might get close to her. His letters were laced with threats and a conviction that they couldn't live without each other, that their bond was something unique, something no one could ever understand or break. These writings left no doubt that their mental states were on the brink of catastrophe. They knew their love was forbidden, but they couldn't let go of it. The diaries and letters became crucial evidence in the case, proving that Thomas and Emily were aware they were heading down a path to inevitable tragedy. These documents were presented in court and were a decisive factor in the verdict. The revelation of these writings shattered the image of the perfect Bennett family, exposing the horrific secrets that led to their downfall. The diaries were the final proof of how powerful emotions and internal conflicts could destroy even the closest of people, turning their lives into a nightmare from which there was no escape. On March 25, 2024, the judge delivered a verdict that marked the culmination of one of the most shocking trials in Springfield's history. Thomas and Emily Bennett were found guilty of the murder of their father, Robert Bennett. The trial was long and agonizing, with numerous recesses as the defense attorneys tried to present psychological evaluations, arguing that the defendant's mental states should mitigate their punishment. The judge, though considering the mental conditions of Thomas and Emily, could not overlook the brutality of their crime. There was no justification they could offer to the law or society. Thomas was sentenced to 25 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after 20 years but with mandatory psychiatric supervision. Emily, whose role in the crime was seen as complicity under duress, received 20 years, with the possibility of parole after 15 years, also with mandatory psychiatric treatment throughout her sentence. On the day the verdict was announced, the courtroom was silent. Thomas and Emily's eyes were dull, showing no emotion when the judge delivered the sentence. Emily quietly wept, tears streaming down her cheeks, but she didn't say a word. Thomas, on the other hand, seemed completely detached from the proceedings, his face a mask of indifference. But inside each of them, a storm of emotions was tearing them apart. They realized they had lost everything, each other, their family, their freedom, and perhaps even themselves. After the trial, the town of Springfield would never be the same. The Bennett home, once a symbol of peace and prosperity, 
became a grim monument to destruction. The townspeople, shaken by the horror, began avoiding even talking about the story, as if fearing that mentioning the tragedy might awaken dormant nightmares. Local legends quickly spread throughout Springfield. Some said the Bennett House was cursed, some claimed they heard strange sounds coming from its walls at night, and others said they saw shadows in the windows. Even though the house had long been abandoned, people began to believe that the Bennett tragedy had permanently scarred the place, and that anyone who dared enter the house might encounter the same madness that destroyed this family. Robert Bennett's business was shut down, and his partners tried to forget about their past. Sarah, the mother of Thomas and Emily, was found in a state of shock in her room a few days after the verdict was announced. She was hospitalized and remained isolated from the outside world for a long time. The locals, fearing they might become involved in this curse, stopped talking about the Bennett family and even avoided mentioning their name. The town sank into an atmosphere of fear and suspicion, where everyone felt that the horror of this story could touch them at any moment. After the sentencing, Thomas and Emily were sent to different prisons, isolated not only from each other but also from the world they once knew. Their lives turned into an endless nightmare, where each day was filled with the pain of memories. Emily, in her solitary cell, suffered from constant nightmares, reliving her father's death over and over. Her mental state deteriorated, and she became increasingly withdrawn, refusing to communicate with prison psychologists. In the rare letter she wrote but never sent, Emily addressed Thomas, begging him for forgiveness and forgiving him in return. Thomas, in his cell, also found no solace. He heard his father's voice accusing him of betrayal and destroying the family. These hallucinations became part of his daily life, and he sank deeper into the abyss of despair. Thomas barely interacted with other inmates, spending most of his time in silence, except for the rare moments when he argued out loud with someone no one else could hear. Springfield, once a peaceful and prosperous town, would never recover from this tragedy. The Bennett family story became entrenched in local folklore, serving as a grim warning to anyone who dared to ignore taboos and hide the truth. Legends of the cursed Bennett house would be passed down from generation to generation, a reminder that even the quietest and most peaceful places can harbor the darkest secrets. The townspeople no longer spoke of the story aloud, but everyone knew that the shadow of the tragedy still lingered over their homes, and while Springfield eventually returned to its routine, the people knew the horror that once befell their town could return if they allowed their dark sides to surface again. Halewood is a small town in the heart of America, nestled in greenery and morning mists. A sense of harmony prevails here, well-kept houses, neatly trimmed lawns, and friendly neighbors who always greet each other with a smile. The town seems like it stepped straight out of a brochure, where people live in their own little paradise, far from the noise of big cities. The streets of Halewood appear quiet and safe, as if shielded from all the world's troubles. However, beneath this idyllic exterior, shadows lurk in Halewood, as in any other place, each resident has their own secrets. Here, family issues, personal tragedies, or inner demons are rarely spoken of aloud. Behind the closed doors of many homes, events unfold that must never become public knowledge. The town goes about its business, but in every home, in every family, there's something unspoken. It is this hidden world, full of untold secrets, that will set the stage for the tragedy unfolding in the Hall household. Margaret Hall, a 70-year-old resident of Halewood, is known for her kindness and generosity. She has been a widow for many years, and her only son, Thomas, left town long ago. The people of Halewood see Margaret as the embodiment of resilience and nobility. Her garden is always in bloom, and her home radiates warmth and coziness. But behind this outward kindness lies something more. Margaret is a woman with deep inner turmoil and secrets that remain hidden from those around her. There are things in her past she prefers not to remember but which continue to haunt her. Liam Hall, Margaret's 16-year-old grandson, recently moved in with his grandmother after a difficult period in his life. His parents divorced, and his father, unable to cope with his son's issues, sent him to Halewood, hoping that the quiet life under Margaret's care would help Liam recover. Outwardly, Liam appears to be a calm and reserved teenager, but there's something unsettling about him. His eyes, set deep beneath furrowed brows, radiate a hidden aggression. He rarely smiles and often retreats into himself, as if he's not really in Halewood but somewhere far away, in a world of his own thoughts and fears. The first few weeks after Liam's arrival passed quietly, but soon the neighbors began to notice strange occurrences at the Hall House. At night, sounds like screams or loud arguments could be heard coming from the house. The lights in the windows often stayed on until late at night, and sometimes shadows could be seen moving through the rooms, 
as if someone was being pursued. These shadows unsettled the neighbors, but no one dared to speak of it openly. On the streets, Margaret and Liam behaved differently. Their relationship seemed odd. They often argued, and sometimes the arguments escalated into full-blown fights. But there were other moments when they seemed too close to one another. Some neighbors noticed that Liam had started showing aggression at school, had become withdrawn, and avoided socializing with his peers. With each passing week, the tension between Liam and Margaret grew, but at the same time, they began to grow closer on a level that went beyond normal family bonds. It started with innocent touches and lingering glances, but gradually escalated into something more. A secret romance between grandmother and grandson became a reality, further entangling Liam in a web of emotions and desires that were tearing him apart from the inside. Margaret, on the other hand, was fully aware of the forbidden nature of their relationship, but she was overwhelmed by feelings she could not control. These hidden passions created an inner conflict in Liam, exacerbating his psychological issues. Their relationship became increasingly tense and unpredictable, setting the stage for the impending tragedy. It is mid-October, and the chill of early autumn begins to settle in Halewood. The trees are shedding their last leaves, and dark clouds hang low over the town, casting a gloomy atmosphere. During these days, Margaret Hall, who used to step out onto her porch every morning to water her flowers and greet the neighbors, suddenly stops appearing. Her absence becomes noticeable, especially to the close neighbors who are used to her constant presence. At first, no one thinks much of it, assuming that Margaret might be ill or has decided to rest. However, as the days pass, her disappearance begins to cause concern. At night, neighbors start to notice strange occurrences around the Hall House. The lights turn on and off at odd hours, even though no one has seen anyone enter or leave. Occasionally, shadows move in the windows, but there are no signs of movement or sound from within the house. On the evening of October 17th, the tension finally erupts. The local police receive an anonymous call reporting a domestic disturbance at the Hall House. When officers arrive at the scene, they are met with an eerie silence. The door is locked, but after a few moments of knocking, Liam appears at the window. His face is pale, and his eyes look haunted. When the police ask about Margaret, Liam responds only with silence. The officers are uneasy but decide to break down the door. Inside the house, the scene that greets them is horrifying. Margaret Hall is found lying lifeless in her bedroom, her body positioned awkwardly on the floor as though she fell from the bed. But what is even more shocking is the sight of Liam, who is sitting in the corner of the room, staring blankly ahead. He is covered in his grandmother's blood. The smell of rotting food and stale air fills the room. Following the horrifying discovery of Margaret Hall's body, the Halewood police immediately began a thorough examination of the crime scene. Experts started their work at the murder site, meticulously documenting every detail they found. Several strange objects seemed out of place and even ominous in the context of a typical home, an antique amulet covered in dried blood, a stack of old photographs with the faces cut out, and charred fragments of books that appeared to contain writings in an unknown language. The most disturbing discovery was a set of letters hidden in the drawer of an old desk. These letters, written in Margaret's hand, were dated several decades ago. In them, she mentioned a family curse and described terrifying visions that had haunted her since her youth. She spoke of black shadows she saw at night and heard whispers emanating from the walls of her house. These letters suggested that mental illness may have been present in the family for many years, raising concerns for the investigators. Additionally, a journal belonging to Liam was found on one of the tables, but its pages had been torn out and scattered around the room. Only a few intact pages remained, describing strange dreams in which Liam saw his grandmother not as a kind elderly woman but as something sinister and threatening, the police began questioning neighbors to gather information about Margaret and Liam. During conversations with Halewood residents, conflicting information emerged. Some described Margaret as a kind and caring grandmother who led a quiet and reclusive life, taking care of her grandson after he was sent to live with her due to family problems. These neighbors believed that she was simply trying to help a boy who had found himself in a difficult situation. However, other neighbors spoke of strange occurrences around the Hall House. They mentioned nighttime screams, strange rituals that Margaret and Liam allegedly performed in the yard, and some even claimed to have seen Liam lighting fires and whispering something as he stood before them. Rumors began to circulate that Liam was attempting to cleanse the house, possibly following some ancient rituals to expel demons or rid the home of a curse. The police began to focus closely on Liam, who became the prime suspect. 
psychologists brought in for the case started creating a psychological profile of him. They noted that Liam grew up in an emotionally unstable environment, which was exacerbated after his move to Halewood. Even before moving to Halewood, Liam had issues with aggression and depression, as confirmed by his school records and reports from school psychologists. Particular attention was drawn to his journal, where Liam described his dreams and fantasies. The remaining pages contained descriptions of scenes of violence and death that eerily resembled what happened to Margaret. Liam wrote about his fear of something indescribable that he sensed in his grandmother's house and how this something gradually took over his mind. The journal also contained mentions of a black shadow that, according to him, followed him and provoked an overwhelming desire to cleanse the house. During further investigation, a shocking truth emerged about the secret romantic relationship between Margaret and Liam. The police found letters exchanged between Liam and Margaret indicating that their relationship had gone beyond normal family bonds. These letters were filled with words of love and affection, but also hinted at the inner conflict, especially on Liam's part. Witnesses began to recall that their relationship had seemed strange for some time. Margaret and Liam spent too much time together, often holding hands in public, and their conversations sometimes appeared too personal and intimate. This connection added a new layer to the investigation, complicating it even further. The police began to suspect that these relationships may have been the cause of the tragedy, especially in light of Liam's mental state and inner turmoil. Investigators now had to figure out how these secret feelings could have escalated into something much more sinister, leading to the brutal murder. When the police discovered Margaret Hall's diaries, it came as a real shock to everyone involved in the investigation. Initially, they expected to find the writings of a typical elderly woman, thoughts about gardening, memories of her youth, household tips. However, what they found was far from ordinary. Margaret's diaries revealed her deepest and darkest secrets. In some entries, she detailed her inner torment related to her forbidden feelings for Liam. She admitted that her love for her grandson had crossed the boundaries of normal family relations and had turned into something much more complex and frightening. In these entries, Margaret repeatedly mentioned how she struggled with these feelings, fully aware of their immorality yet unable to control them. The diaries also contained references to strange rituals and ceremonies that Margaret conducted in hopes of cleansing Liam of evil spirits or dark forces that she believed were beginning to possess him. These writings became increasingly paranoid as Margaret delved deeper into her own fears and visions. She wrote about how shadows watched her, how voices whispered to her about impending doom, and how she felt a certain curse hanging over her family. The discovery of these diaries significantly altered the course of the investigation. Investigators realized that Margaret was on the brink of a nervous breakdown and that her mental state may have directly influenced her actions in the final months of her life. The diaries pointed to Margaret's deep emotional attachment to Liam, which may have led to her extreme obsession with his fate and well-being. Judging by her writings, Margaret lived in constant fear of the consequences of their relationship. She was terrified that their bond might be exposed and that it would ruin their lives. This fear seemed to only strengthen her determination to protect Liam by any means necessary, even if it meant resorting to extreme measures. Simultaneously, with the analysis of Margaret's diaries, police and psychologists began to more closely examine Liam's mental state. It became clear that Liam, being a witness and participant in the strange rituals his grandmother conducted, was under her strong influence. He became increasingly withdrawn and anxious, which manifested in his behavior and conversations with friends. One of Liam's friends told the police that in the weeks leading up to the tragedy, Liam increasingly spoke about feeling trapped and that his grandmother was forcing him to do things he didn't want to do. This friend also noted that Liam began showing signs of paranoia, claiming that someone or something was watching him and that he heard voices constantly telling him what to do. The police also uncovered a secret correspondence between Liam and an anonymous individual, which he conducted through internet forums and social media. In these messages, Liam described his struggle with inner demons and fears. He admitted to hearing voices that urged him toward violence and that sometimes he felt on the brink of insanity. In one of the messages, Liam wrote that he could no longer live in such a state and that something must happen. These exchanges made investigators consider the possibility that Liam was not just a victim but also a participant in the events that led to the tragedy. The emotional burden and pressure related to his feelings for Margaret could have driven him to commit a crime he didn't fully comprehend. These new revelations and evidence only added to the mystery of the case, forcing investigators to search for answers to increasingly troubling and complex questions. From the start of the trial, prosecutors took a firm stance, 
portraying Liam as a young man deeply involved in dark and dangerous practices under his grandmother's influence. Prosecutors argued that Liam was not a passive victim but knowingly participated in the rituals Margaret conducted. They presented evidence that it was this forbidden relationship and the mental disorder induced by Margaret's manipulations that led to the tragedy. Prosecutors emphasized that while Liam may have been under Margaret's control, this did not absolve him of responsibility for the crime. They described him as an unstable young man whose mental state gradually deteriorated to the point where he became capable of murder. The prosecutors also mentioned the influence of rituals and the voices that, according to Liam, incited him to violence. However, they insisted that Liam acted consciously and deliberately. One of the prosecution's key points was evidence that Liam had consciously prepared for the murder. Prosecutors pointed out that Liam had acquired the murder weapon, a knife that was later used to kill Margaret. Forensic analysis showed that Liam's fingerprints were on the knife, along with traces of blood, indicating his direct involvement in the crime. Additionally, the prosecutors presented Liam's correspondence with his friend in which he talked about his intention to change something and free himself from the pressure he was experiencing. These messages, according to the prosecution, indicated the premeditation of his actions. Particular attention was given to Liam's attempt to cover up the crime. Prosecutors argued that after the murder, he meticulously cleaned the knife to hide his tracks and even attempted to stage a robbery to mislead the police. Liam's defense built its case on proving that at the time of the crime, Liam was not aware of his actions and was entirely under his grandmother's control. Liam's attorneys brought in psychiatrists who testified about his severe mental state. They claimed that Liam suffered from a serious mental disorder, making him vulnerable to Margaret's manipulations. The defense also insisted that Liam was merely a tool in his grandmother's hands, who, according to her diaries, suffered from her own psychological issues and used Liam to fulfill her dark plans. The defense argued that Margaret was the instigator of all the horrific events and that Liam acted under her influence, unable to control his actions. The defense highlighted Margaret's diaries, which had been discovered by the police. These records, in the defense's view, clearly indicated that Margaret planned and controlled all of Liam's actions. The diaries describe her feelings for her grandson, her fears, and paranoia, as well as the rituals she performed with Liam. Liam's attorneys maintained that Margaret's diaries proved she deliberately involved him in her rituals, manipulating his psyche and driving him to a state where he could no longer distinguish reality from his fears. They argued that Liam was merely a puppet in his grandmother's hands and could not bear full responsibility for his actions. After lengthy and complex debates, the presentation of numerous pieces of evidence and witness testimonies, the court reached its verdict. Liam was found guilty of Margaret's murder. However, considering his mental state and the influence his grandmother had on him, the court decided to commit him to mandatory treatment in a psychiatric facility. The court acknowledged that although Liam was responsible for his actions, his mental health problems and the psychological pressure exerted by his grandmother played a significant role in the tragedy. The case became one of the most talked about and controversial in the region. The debate over whether Liam truly acted of his own free will or was an innocent victim of his grandmother's influence lingered for years. While some believed Liam deserved to be punished, others saw the tragedy as a result of a toxic and damaging relationship between the two. The tragedy proved even more destructive. The town, once known for its tranquility and safety, became a place where residents began to fear one another. An atmosphere of distrust and fear spread throughout, with rumors about Liam and his possible powers becoming part of the town's lore. People began to whisper that Liam had awakened something sinister within his psyche, a force that might continue to haunt him even after the trial. Stories emerged about strange occurrences in the house where he lived with his grandmother, unexplained noises, cold drafts, flickering lights in the windows. Even though the house was now empty, these rumors fueled fear and mistrust, and many residents began to avoid the street where the Hall House was located. Over time, the house gained a sinister reputation, becoming a symbol of Halewood's shattered ideal. Liam Hall was committed to a specialized psychiatric clinic where his condition was closely monitored by doctors and psychiatrists. However, even in the controlled environment of inpatient treatment, his mental state remained unstable. Liam suffered from constant nightmares in which he saw visions of his grandmother, bloody rituals, and strange figures that, according to him, were guiding him. He often woke up in a cold sweat, screaming and begging to be left alone. Psychiatrists diagnosed Liam with post-traumatic stress disorder, triggered by both the crime itself and the prolonged influence of his grandmother. Despite the doctor's efforts, Liam continued to insist that he heard voices urging him to return to the house where it all happened, 
to complete something unfinished. These symptoms indicated a deep psychological disturbance, making the prospect of his full recovery increasingly doubtful. As Liam's treatment continued, it became more apparent that the question of his return to normal life remained open. Even if his mental state stabilized, whether he would be safe for society was a significant concern. The doctors acknowledged that cases like Liam's required long-term monitoring and therapy, and they could not guarantee that his condition would improve enough for him to resume a normal life. Meanwhile, rumors about Liam continued to spread. People talked about his mystical visions and strange occurrences in the clinic. Flickering lights in his room, sudden cold drafts, and odd shadows reportedly seen by other patients. These rumors added even more mystery and fear around his persona. Some began to believe that Liam would forever be trapped in his nightmares, never fully ridding himself of the demons haunting him. The residents of Halewood increasingly avoided mentioning him, preferring to leave this dark episode behind, though forgetting it was no longer an option. A small town in South Carolina is gripped with concern when the entire Carter family suddenly disappears. No one has seen Jason Carter, his wife Danielle, or their 19-year-old daughter, Syra, for several days. Neighbors are worried, especially since Jason has always been a pillar of the local community, a calm and respectable businessman. The story begins in a quiet suburb of South Carolina where the Carter family lives. Jason Carter, a 45-year-old charismatic businessman, owns a successful restaurant that's popular with the locals. He is known for his sociability, professionalism, and genuine dedication to his family. Jason creates the image of the perfect husband and father, always smiling and willing to help. His business not only provides a stable income but also earns him respect in the local community. His wife, Danielle Carter, a 38-year-old housewife, is fully focused on raising her daughter from a previous marriage, Syra Carter. Syra, a 19-year-old college student, lives with her parents and is preparing for adult life. For a long time, Danielle was confident in the strength of their marriage. She believed Jason to be a caring husband, despite his frequent late nights at work and occasional trips supposedly related to the restaurant business. Over time, Danielle begins to notice that the relationship between Jason and Syra is becoming increasingly tense and unusual. Syra, usually open and friendly, starts behaving strangely. She stops sharing her problems with her mother, becomes secretive, and emotionally distant. Syra often comes home late at night, refuses to talk about where she's been, and spends a lot of time in her room. Jason too seems to be paying more attention to Syra than before. He begins to take a deeper interest in her life, defending her in arguments with Danielle. Danielle starts noticing strange glances between them. At first, she chalks it up to Jason being overly protective, but soon her concerns grow. One day, while cleaning Syra's room, Danielle finds some strange notes. These short messages weren't written by her daughter, but they contained intimate and disturbingly affectionate phrases. You're the one who makes me feel alive, one of the notes said. This alarmed her, but Danielle tries to convince herself it could just be teenage flirting. However, a few days later, she notices that Jason and Syra have been exchanging odd glances. This invisible barrier between them makes her heart race with anxiety. For several nights in a row, Danielle can't sleep, consumed by thoughts of what might be happening in her home. Her mind is filled with frightening scenarios, and she starts paying closer attention to even the smallest details. Syra's solo trips, Jason's constant phone calls when she's gone, all of it intensifies her suspicions. Danielle decides to keep a closer eye on Jason and Syra's behavior, sensing that something unimaginably dark is happening within the family. One late evening, when the tension in the house becomes unbearable, Danielle decides to follow Jason and Syra. She feels she can no longer ignore the oddities in their behavior. Anxiety gnaws at her as she hides in the shadows of the hallway and watches Jason quietly head into Syra's bedroom, closing the door behind him. Around midnight, Danielle creeps up to the door and hears muffled voices. She overhears a conversation that fills her with dread. Syra whispers to Jason, We have to keep this from everyone. No one can ever find out about our secrets. Danielle freezes in shock. Different scenarios run through her mind, but she isn't ready to believe the worst just yet. Her thoughts are torn apart. On one hand, this is her family, but on the other, what's happening behind that door no longer seems innocent. She decides not to react immediately, convinced that she needs more solid evidence before making any accusations. After that night, Danielle can't sleep. She starts noticing more and more strange behavior between them. Their glances become even more secretive, and now they avoid being around her. 
At the same time, these details only heighten her anxiety. She begins to suspect that there's something much darker between Jason and Syrah than just secrets. Feeling that the situation has spiraled too far, Danielle finally decides to confront Jason. When she works up the courage to ask questions, his reaction shocks her. Jason meets her suspicions with calmness and even a hint of contempt. He acts as though her accusations are absurd and starts using psychological manipulation. Jason tells Danielle that she's probably just tired or going through a midlife crisis, making her feel irrational. You're just jealous of Syra because she's growing up and becoming independent, Jason says, adding that Danielle is being overly paranoid and seeing things that aren't there. His cold logic leaves her confused, and Danielle starts doubting herself. Jason twists everything so that her anxiety and suspicions seem like nothing more than jealousy and paranoia. Her attempts to discuss something more concrete only lead to greater confusion and doubt. Jason skillfully manipulates her, turning her efforts to expose him into what seem like her own psychological issues. Do you really think I'd be stupid enough to risk our family? He chuckles softly, looking at her with the demeanor of a man who has nothing to hide. This game starts to wear on her mind. She becomes lost in her own suspicions, which no one else seems to acknowledge. After weeks of sleepless nights and inner turmoil, Danielle decides to dig deeper. She realizes that Jason's words can't explain her feelings, and she needs to take decisive action. One night, while Jason is working late, she decides to check his computer. After cracking his password, she finds a folder protected by another password, sparking her suspicions. Nervously trying several guesses, she finally breaks in. Inside, Danielle finds something that shatters her world. There, she discovers a series of photos and videos capturing horrifying scenes between Jason and Syra. These images reveal intimate interactions between them, leaving Danielle shocked and devastated. This isn't just an affair. It's a complete manipulation and control over her daughter. The videos show Jason using his role as stepfather to psychologically and physically dominate Syra, dragging her into a toxic relationship. Stunned by the discovery, Danielle can't believe her family has fallen apart to this extent. Fear and anger consume her. Jason has betrayed her in the most horrific way, and he has turned out to be a monster, abusing her daughter. In her despair, Danielle begins planning her next steps, realizing she will have to confront not only Jason but also the dark secrets that now threaten to destroy everything she once knew. After the terrifying discovery of the secret affair between Jason and Syrah, Danielle's mind spirals into chaos. She knows she can't just sit idly by. Her daughter needs to be saved. Jason, the man she loved and trusted as the foundation of their family, is a predator. Danielle decides to act quickly and decisively. She begins to develop an escape plan in her mind. She envisions a night escape, fleeing with Syrah under the cover of darkness, finding refuge in another town, and starting a new life. She plans everything, packs small suitcases, keeps important documents within reach, and even starts looking for a safe place where Jason won't find them. Danielle is fully convinced that Syrah is a victim, and it's her duty to save her daughter from the destructive relationship with her stepfather. But when Danielle shares her escape plan with Syrah, her daughter's reaction alarms her. Syrah responds with cold indifference. She refuses to leave with her mother, telling her that there's nothing wrong between her and Jason. When Danielle insists, Syrah becomes aggressive, denying everything and defending Jason. It becomes clear that Syra has been fully brainwashed by Jason. She refuses to admit the truth, and in some twisted way, she's convinced herself that this is all normal behavior. Syra deflects, mocks her mother's concern, and seems completely lost in a distorted reality. She even claims that Danielle is overreacting and trying to ruin their family. The argument grows increasingly hostile, with Syra accusing her mother of being jealous and paranoid. No matter how hard Danielle tries to explain the photos and videos she found, Syrah stubbornly denies everything. She is deeply entangled in Jason's control. Danielle realizes she's trapped in a deadly game. Jason and CRA, now acting as allies, have decided to eliminate her in a desperate attempt to escape the city. Alone, Danielle moves quickly, but it's too late. Soon, her life falls under the control of Jason and CRA's devious scheme. They stage a car accident, cleverly manipulating the situation to make it appear as a tragic mishap. Danielle realizes this isn't just an attempt to drive her out of their lives, it's a lethal game. In a final, terrifying moment, she's caught in a trap set by her own family. 
Jason and CRA lure her to a meeting, promising a peaceful resolution to all their problems. Panicked and confused, Danielle decides to take the risk and shows up. However, things quickly spiral out of control. CRA, relishing the moment, toys with her mother's fears, while Jason, completely under CRA's manipulation, prepares for the final blow. Late in the evening on a deserted forest road outside of town, normally empty at this hour, the stage is set for the terrifying climax of this family conflict. Jason and CRA are confident that their plan to eliminate Danielle will go off without a hitch. They chose this isolated stretch of forest intentionally. No witnesses, and any accident can easily be written off as a coincidence. Jason, fully under CRA's control, believes they will get away with it, but Danielle, though her mind is clouded with fear, begins to realize that this isn't just Jason's plan. As the car approaches a dangerous curve in the road, it becomes clear to her that the entire situation was orchestrated not by Jason but by her daughter. CRA has been playing both of them from the very start, manipulating their lives and emotions. Danielle suddenly sees all the signs she ignored for so long, the cold stares, the hidden smirks, the secret plots. When the car pulls over on the side of the forest road, CRA decides it's time to act. She opens the door, and Jason steps out, intending to drag Danielle out by force. But unexpectedly, Danielle musters the courage to fight for her life. A physical struggle ensues, bringing months and years of betrayal to the surface in a violent confrontation. Though Jason is physically stronger, he is mentally exhausted and starts losing control of the situation. In a desperate moment, Danielle strikes back. When he lunges at her, she pushes him with all her strength. Jason loses his balance and falls, hitting his head on a rock at the edge of the road. It all happens too quickly, and his life ends in an instant. The shock of what just happened completely overwhelms Danielle. She stares at her husband's lifeless body, unable to comprehend what has just transpired. But her horror is only beginning to unfold. At that moment, she turns to CRA, hoping her daughter will finally understand that they can be free from Jason's manipulation. But her hopes are crushed when she sees the expression on CRA's face, cold, calculating, with no hint of fear or regret. CRA steps forward, already knowing how to use the situation to her advantage. She skillfully stages the scene to make it look as though Danielle killed Jason to cover up something bigger. She even screams toward an imaginary witness, pretending to protect herself from her unstable mother. Before Danielle can fully grasp what's happening, CRA tosses the weapon, which she claims Danielle used to strike Jason, to the ground and disappears into the dark woods. She heads toward the nearest highway, ready to call the police and portray herself as the innocent victim. Her plan is simple. She'll claim that her mother went mad when she discovered their affair and killed Jason in a fit of rage. When the police arrive, they find Danielle in shock, standing beside her husband's body. The scene that CRA has set looks convincing, and all the blame falls on Danielle. The police quickly arrest her, believing the version of events that CRA has presented. CRA expertly portrays herself as the innocent victim of a deranged mother who couldn't handle the jealousy and anger. Danielle, fully aware of the truth, is left trapped in a horrific nightmare. Her world has completely crumbled. She's lost her husband, her own daughter has betrayed her, and now CRA has become the true puppet master orchestrating the final act of this tragedy. The morning after the tragic night on the forest road, Danielle Carter finds herself at the center of a police investigation. CRA skillfully plays the victim. Her tears, disheveled hair, and injured wrist paint a clear picture for the authorities. She claims that Danielle killed Jason in a jealous rage and then tried to kill her daughter when she attempted to protect her father. The police, based on the initial evidence, quickly arrest Danielle, charging her with her husband's murder and the attempted murder of her daughter. In the early days of the investigation, the case seems straightforward. Local media quickly pick up on the story of the jealous wife who couldn't handle learning about her husband's affair with her daughter. The story CRA presented appears credible at first glance. At the crime scene, they find the weapon with Danielle's fingerprints and signs of a struggle, further supporting CRA's version of events. Detectives Lawrence and Reed lead the investigation. Initially, they don't doubt CRA's story, but something doesn't sit right. The case seems too straightforward. Their suspicions grow as they analyze the details of CRA's statements. Some aspects seem overly theatrical, and her behavior in the days that follow doesn't align with that of a grieving daughter. The key moment comes when Lawrence and Reed decide to dig deeper into CRA's life. During a search of her room, 
they find an old diary tucked away among the books on her shelf. They immediately seize it, unaware of the crucial discoveries it holds. In CRA's diary, written over the past few years, she details her observations and thoughts, which shock the detectives. She describes her gradual plan to manipulate Jason step by step until he was completely under her control. The entries reveal how she wanted to get rid of Danielle and become the sole authority in the household, controlling everything from Jason's business to the family assets. These writings prove that the relationship between CRA and Jason wasn't an accidental affair, but rather a premeditated manipulation by the daughter. She had been planning the crime for a long time, calculating that she could frame Danielle when the time came. These diaries changed the course of the investigation. Detectives Lawrence and Reed now see a completely different picture of events. They realize Danielle was the victim of an elaborate psychological game, where she had been used as a scapegoat. Further interviews with CRA's friends and acquaintances reveal even more disturbing details. It turns out CRA had been leading a double life for quite some time, controlling not only Jason but others around her, manipulating their emotions for her own benefit. Her friends recall strange stories about how CRA always got what she wanted and how easily she could get others to do her bidding. As the detectives piece together new evidence, CRA begins to realize that her plan is falling apart. She loses control of the situation, and her lies increasingly contradict the facts. Soon, the police uncover more evidence of her involvement in the crime. Text messages between Jason and CRA that confirm her influence over him and her intentions to eliminate Danielle. The detectives return to Danielle, who had been held in custody, accused of her husband's murder. When they inform her of the new findings, she finally sees a glimmer of hope. The realization that her daughter and husband had betrayed her breaks her heart, but now she knows the truth is starting to surface. The case is reclassified, and CRA becomes the prime suspect, while Danielle transforms from the accused into the victim of a malicious conspiracy. The trial began on December 3, 2022, at the district court, and it drew widespread media attention. The prosecution, led by seasoned attorney James Hammond, aimed to prove that CRA Carter had orchestrated her stepfather Jason's murder and then tried to frame her mother Danielle by manipulating both sides. The prosecution presented a series of compelling evidence from CRA's diaries, which exposed her meticulously planned scheme to her text messages with Jason. These records demonstrated how CRA had been playing a psychological game to trap Danielle. On the first day of the trial, CRA continued to portray herself as the victim, claiming she had been afraid of her mother and that her actions were out of self-defense. Her lawyer attempted to build a defense based on CRA being controlled by her mother, arguing that she was too young and confused when Jason and Danielle's conflict unfolded. CRA made emotional statements accusing her mother of being overly cruel and dominant in the family. However, the prosecutor introduced the diaries and witness testimony that shattered the image of CRA as an innocent victim. Disturbing facts emerged in court. CRA had been planning for a long time to get rid of her mother so she could fully control Jason. Testimonies from CRA's friends, who spoke about her manipulative nature, bolstered the prosecution's case. They recounted how she had used others to achieve her goals, including her stepfather. A pivotal moment in the trial was Danielle's testimony. Her statements were filled with pain and heartbreak. She described her devastation upon learning the truth and how CRA had manipulated not only Jason but also her. Her words convinced the jury that Danielle had been the victim of a calculated plot, not the instigator of violence. Throughout the trial, CRA's lawyer tried to downplay her guilt, arguing that she was just a confused young woman caught in a difficult situation. However, the prosecution insisted that CRA had deliberately caused the tragedy, fully aware of the consequences of her actions. In January 11, 2023, the jury delivered their verdict. CRA Carter was found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and attempting to frame her mother. She was sentenced to 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole for the first 15 years. The verdict caused an outpouring of emotions in the courtroom. Danielle was exonerated of the murder charges, but her emotional state remained shattered. Freed from accusations, Danielle returned home, but her life would never be the same. In the aftermath, the case became a chilling reminder of the power of manipulation within families. It left an indelible mark on both Danielle and CRA, whose path toward darkness had only begun. Acquaintances and preferred to work remotely to avoid social interactions throughout 2023, her life was filled with internal battles against the ghosts of her past, but she held on to hope that one day she would find peace. In the fall of 2023, just as Danielle thought her life was finally calming down, 
she received a strange letter. It arrived in November with no return address, containing only a few lines. You thought you knew the whole truth about Jason and CRA. That was only the beginning. What you discovered was just the tip of the iceberg. Someone else was pulling the strings, and they didn't want you to know more. Be careful, the story isn't over. The letter shook Danielle. Her heart raced as she read the words over and over again. She had been ready to close that chapter of her life, but the letter made her question. Could someone else have been behind the tragedy that destroyed her family? Did CRA have accomplices, or had someone been manipulating her as she had manipulated Jason? There were many questions and no answers. Danielle didn't know what to do next. She could ignore the letter and try to move on with her life, but her instincts told her that the story wasn't over yet. The past was catching up with her, and now she faced a choice. Leave it all behind or start her own investigation to uncover the truth. Will Danielle finally close this tragic chapter of her life, or will she face new, shocking revelations that will once again turn her world upside down? Riverdale, a small town in Missouri, always seemed like an oasis of tranquility and well-being. The green streets lined with neat houses and white picket fences created the atmosphere of a typical American suburb where life flowed smoothly and predictably. The evenings here were especially quiet. Only the rustling of the wind in the trees and the distant voices of neighbors disturbed the idle calm. On the evening of May 15, 2014, Henry Stewart, a retired police officer with over 30 years of service, was spending time at home as usual. Despite his retirement, Henry remained an active member of the local community. He was respected for his years of impeccable service in the police force, during which he had investigated hundreds of cases and earned a reputation as an honest and incorruptible man. But that evening, Henry was enjoying his well-deserved rest, sitting in a chair on the porch of his house with a newspaper in hand and a cup of strong tea on the table beside him. The Stewart home was the epitome of a cozy family hearth. Located on a quiet street, it stood out among the other houses with its well-kept garden and bright flowers, which were planted by Jessica, the wife of Michael, Henry's son. Her care for the house and garden was known to all the neighbors, who often came to her for advice on plant care. Jessica Stewart was a model homemaker and mother of two children, Emma and Lucas. Her days were filled with routine chores, school meetings, shopping at the local supermarket, preparing dinners, and maintaining perfect order in the house. Her world revolved around her family, and though her life might have seemed monotonous, Jessica found satisfaction in it. Michael Stewart, her husband, was a successful real estate agent known in Riverdale for his charm and ability to close the best deals. Michael often worked late, showing houses or attending business dinners. He was the one who provided for the family financially, allowing Jessica to focus on the home and children. That evening, Michael was busy as well. He was involved in an important meeting with potential clients, hoping to close a deal that could bring him substantial profit. It was one of those evenings when his work seemed to completely consume him, and he paid little attention to what was happening at home. Jessica, accustomed to his long working hours, didn't show any displeasure. She took care of the children, prepared dinner, and mentally planned the next day, unaware that her life was about to be turned upside down. The house was filled with the usual evening atmosphere. Emma and Lucas were playing in their room, occasionally arguing over who would get to control the video game next. Jessica occasionally checked in on them to make sure they weren't fighting, and then returned to cooking dinner. She had glanced at the clock several times, expecting Michael to come home, but knew that he was likely to be late again. Meanwhile, Henry remained on the porch, enjoying the coolness of the spring evening. He liked watching the town slowly fall asleep. The lights in the neighboring houses gradually dimmed, and the street grew quieter. He knew that his family was safe, and that feeling brought him peace. These peaceful evenings were an important ritual for him. Henry often reflected on his life, reminisced about his days in the police force, and took pride in the fact that his son Michael had built a successful career and provided for his family. Henry felt that his retirement years could be just as calm and happy as this evening, but he had no idea what secrets were hidden behind the walls of his own home. Thus began the evening that would soon lead to a chain of events that would forever change the lives of all the members of the Stewart family and turn everything they thought was familiar and stable upside down. The story of the secret affair between Henry and Jessica began in the summer of 2013, when Jessica first felt that her life was becoming unbearably predictable. Her days passed in a monotonous routine, taking care of the children, keeping the house in order, and meeting with neighbors for a cup of coffee. Michael, her husband, was consumed by work, increasingly distant from the family. 
Their marriage, once strong and reliable, began to crack, and despite her patience and resilience, Jessica felt that she was losing herself in this closed loop. Henry, Michael's father, often visited their home. He loved spending time with his grandchildren, telling them stories about his time in the police force and occasionally giving Michael advice about work. One of those evenings, when Michael was once again at a client meeting, Henry stayed longer than usual. Jessica, feeling lonely, invited him to dinner. They sat in the kitchen, chatting about life, and unexpectedly, Jessica found that she felt comfortable and at ease with Henry in a way she hadn't felt with Michael in a long time. From that moment on, their relationship began to change. Henry, who had long not experienced closeness after his wife's death, found in Jessica something more than just a daughter-in-law. He saw how she suffered from loneliness, how she tried to keep her family together, and he couldn't help but admire her resilience. Jessica, in turn, saw in Henry a wise and understanding person with whom she could talk about everything that troubled her. Their first intimate encounter happened in September of that year. That evening, Michael was once again working late, and the children were already asleep. Henry had come into the house after helping with some minor repairs, and they found themselves alone in the kitchen again. The conversation was warm and relaxed, but when Jessica began to clear the table, their hands accidentally touched. The moment seemed to stretch on, and neither of them hurried to break the contact. Henry, overcoming his inner doubts, touched her cheek, and Jessica, not fully understanding why, didn't pull away. That was how it all began. Their first encounter that evening was brief but left a deep impression on both of them. Henry, feeling a surge of youthful energy that he hadn't felt in years, thought it was a one-time incident that wouldn't happen again. But Jessica couldn't stop thinking about what had happened. Her guilt mixed with a newfound desire, and she was horrified to realize that she didn't want it to end. Gradually, their meetings became more frequent and more risky. They found moments when Michael was busy with work and the children were at school. At first, their relationship was cautious and tentative, but over time, they grew less careful, plunging into a passion that only grew stronger with each passing day. Henry felt more alive than he had in years, and Jessica, for the first time in a long time, felt wanted. However, with each meeting, their relationship became more dangerous. Both understood that if their affair were to be discovered, it would destroy not only their own lives but also the life of the entire family. But they couldn't stop. In the spring of 2014, Jessica began to notice strange things that unsettled her. It started with small things. Doors in the house that she was sure she had closed were left ajar. Sometimes she found items not where she had left them. At first, she attributed it to her forgetfulness or the children's mischief. But as time went on, these small disturbances became increasingly troubling. One night, when Michael was once again late at work and the kids were already asleep, Jessica felt like someone was watching her. She looked around but saw no one. The feeling was so strong that she walked over to the window and looked out into the yard, but there was no one there either. Her heart was racing, and she tried to convince herself it was just her imagination playing tricks on her. Henry, on the other hand, noticed nothing strange. He was completely absorbed in his new relationship with Jessica and felt rejuvenated. The sense of danger seemed to energize him. Henry often caught himself thinking that the risk excited him, and he savored every moment spent with Jessica, despite knowing how it could all end. But Jessica, despite her outward confidence, was starting to lose control of the situation. One day, she found the bedroom door slightly ajar, even though she distinctly remembered closing it before she left. Another time, she discovered her jewelry out of place. Small earrings that she only wore on special occasions had suddenly appeared on the bedside table. At night, she began having nightmares in which Michael or someone else discovered her and Henry together, and these dreams increasingly terrified her. Jessica tried not to show her anxiety to Henry, but her worry still seeped through. She began to notice that Michael was more attentive than usual, his eyes constantly on her, and his behavior had started to change. It was as though he had a sixth sense for her shifting emotions, sensing something that didn't quite add up. One day, Michael came home earlier than usual and found Jessica and Henry sitting in the living room, engaged in what appeared to be a very intimate conversation. Although they were only speaking in quiet voices, the intensity in the room was palpable. Michael stopped at the threshold, his expression hardening as he looked at the two people who were supposed to be his family. It was then that Jessica realized she had lost control of everything. The affair was no longer a secret, and the consequences of their actions were about to be felt. Jessica couldn't reach Henry to arrange a meeting. Usually, he would answer right away or call back,
but this time his phone was turned off. She spent the entire day in anxious anticipation, checking her phone every five minutes, but Henry never got in touch. By evening, her anxiety had turned into panic. Jessica knew Henry wouldn't just disappear without telling her. Her mind started racing with thoughts. Had something happened? Could Michael have found out about them, or had something happened to Henry? When Michael came home, Jessica tried her hardest to conceal her panic. Her hands trembled as she prepared dinner, and she couldn't bring herself to smile when the kids talked about their day. Michael noticed her nervousness but didn't let on, continuing to watch her every move closely. Meanwhile, Michael's suspicions continued to grow. He felt that Jessica was hiding something, but he couldn't figure out what. Henry's disappearance also alarmed him. Usually, they were in frequent contact, but in recent days his father had stopped reaching out. His phone wasn't answering either, which worried Michael even more. On June 1, 2014, after another sleepless night, Michael finally decided to take a desperate step. He remembered an old acquaintance, Thomas Grayson, a private detective known for his skill in finding people and solving the most complex cases. Michael called him and arranged a meeting at a quiet cafe on the outskirts of town, far from prying eyes. When they met, Michael nervously looked around, checking to make sure no one familiar was nearby. He carefully told Thomas about his suspicions without mentioning his hunch about the affair. Michael cited Jessica's changed behavior and Henry's mysterious disappearance. He couldn't understand if these events were connected, but he felt that his wife was hiding something, and he was ready to do whatever it took to find out. Thomas agreed to take the case. He promised to act quickly and quietly to avoid raising any suspicion. Michael handed him a copy of the key he had found in Jessica's purse and asked him to find out what it could unlock. From that moment on, Michael's life became a waiting game. Each morning he woke up with a heavy heart, not knowing what the new day would bring. Jessica, meanwhile, withdrew further into herself, tormented by anxiety and the fear of being exposed. She didn't know that her husband had hired a private detective, but her internal sense of danger never left her for a moment. The tension grew with each passing day, and Michael knew that soon he would learn the truth, no matter how terrible it might be. On June 12, 2014, as Michael anxiously awaited news from Thomas Grayson, the detective finally called, setting up a meeting at his office. Michael arrived with a sinking feeling, sensing that he was about to learn something that would turn his life upside down. Grayson greeted him with a serious look, getting straight to the point without unnecessary preamble. Michael, the detective began, laying out several photographs in front of him. I've managed to confirm your suspicions. Jessica has indeed been having an affair with Henry. These photos were taken at a motel on the outskirts of town. They've been meeting there for several months. Michael stared silently at the photos, which showed his wife and father in a state of intimate closeness, as if there was nothing between them but deep affection. But this wasn't the end. Thomas continued, pulling out another set of photos and documents from a folder. However, there's something else you need to know. Henry was living a double life. I found evidence that he was seen in the company of local criminals. I have records of his meetings with people we've long suspected of having ties to organized crime. Michael was stunned. His father, a respected former police officer, wasn't just hiding an affair. He was involved in something far more dangerous. Thomas handed him documents showing that Henry had been meeting with known mobsters in suspicious locations like abandoned warehouses and illegal gambling dens. He was clearly involved in some sort of dealings. Michael, Grayson continued, and this might be connected to his disappearance. I can't say for sure, but everything points to Henry being in serious danger. When Michael returned home, his anger was barely contained. He found Jessica in the kitchen, busy with routine chores, but her calm demeanor only fueled his rage. He threw the photographs onto the table in front of her. What is this, Jessica? His voice was cold, filled with pain and betrayal. Jessica paled when she saw the photo. Her hands trembled, and she tried to say something, but Michael didn't give her a chance. He demanded explanations, and finally, under pressure, she confessed. Yes, we had an affair, she said quietly, barely holding back tears. But Michael, I don't know where he's gone. In the past few weeks, he wasn't himself. He became secretive, nervous. He kept saying everything was under control, but I could tell something was wrong. Her confession stunned Michael, but she continued, pleading with him to believe her. 
I didn't know about his connections with anyone else, she sobbed. He never told me about that. All I knew was that he wanted to end our affair, saying it was for the best, but he didn't explain anything. Michael could see that she was as scared as he was, but it didn't lessen his pain. He couldn't believe he had lived in a lie for so many years. One thing was clear, Henry had been playing a double game, and now Michael needed to find out exactly what was involved. With each passing day, Michael's obsession with uncovering the full truth about his father grew stronger. He started his own investigation, deciding not to rely solely on Thomas. Michael began gathering information, reviewing old records and phone conversations of Henry's that he managed to obtain through old contacts in the police. He discovered that in the past few months, Henry had withdrawn large sums of money from his accounts, something completely out of character for him. The money had disappeared without a trace. Michael also found records of Henry meeting with people linked to illegal arms and drug trafficking. Michael began to realize that his father was likely involved in serious criminal activities. This might explain his disappearance, either he was on the run, or he had been taken care of because something had gone wrong. Over the next week, Michael delved deeper into the investigation, uncovering more and more shocking details about Henry's double life. He realized that his father might not just have been a participant, but a key player in major criminal operations. At this point, Michael could no longer trust anyone, not even Thomas. He understood that there were too many players in the story, and each one could be dangerous. But one thing was clear, Michael had to see this through and find out what really happened to Henry. On June 20, 2014, after weeks of anxious waiting, Henry suddenly returned home. It was midday, and Jessica was busy preparing lunch. She heard the front door open and turned to see who had come in. To her shock, it was Henry. But something was wrong. Henry looked exhausted. His face was gaunt, and his eyes were filled with tension and fear. His clothes were dirty, as if he hadn't slept or rested in days. Jessica rushed to him, overwhelmed by a mix of joy and terror, but Henry pulled away, his eyes darting around the room as if he feared someone was watching him. Henry, where have you been? What happened to you? She asked, trying to hide her fear. Henry didn't answer at first. Then he lowered his head, avoiding her gaze, and quietly said, I've gotten into some serious trouble, Jess. I can't tell you everything, but I'm being threatened. I need time to figure out what to do next. Jessica didn't know what to think. He looked like a man who had lost all hope, and that scared her more than anything. He clearly avoided talking about where he had been and what had happened during the weeks he was gone. Every time she tried to ask more, he evaded her questions, stumbling over his words. Jessica felt that his disappearance was linked to something far more serious than she had imagined. Late that evening, after being warned by Jessica about Henry's return, Michael decided it was time to finally get some answers. He waited until the children were asleep and quietly left the bedroom to confront Henry in the living room. Henry was sitting on the couch, slumped over, holding a glass of whiskey. He barely noticed Michael's approach. We need to talk, Michael began coldly as he stepped closer. Henry looked up, and Michael saw fear and despair in his eyes. What do you want to talk about? Henry replied, trying to appear calm, but his voice betrayed him. About what you're hiding, Michael continued his voice growing harsher. You disappeared for weeks, Jessica was terrified, and now you come back and act like nothing happened. Where were you? Who were you involved with? Henry tried to turn away, but Michael grabbed his arm, and a struggle ensued. At that moment, a flash drive fell out of Henry's pocket. Michael immediately noticed it and, pushing aside his doubts, picked up the device. What's this? Michael asked, holding the flash drive in front of him. Henry jumped up, trying to snatch it from Michael's hands, but Michael pulled away, his suspicions deepening. That's none of your business. Henry shouted, his face pale with tension. You don't understand what I'm dealing with. Michael, now consumed by anger and disappointment, suddenly realized that the flash drive might contain critical information, possibly evidence Henry had gathered on someone, or worse, materials that could endanger their entire family. They began to fight, with Henry trying to retrieve the flash drive, but in the heat of the struggle, Michael accidentally pushed him, and Henry lost his balance, falling and hitting his head on the edge of the table. Blood quickly spread across the carpet, and Henry lay still. Michael froze, realizing what had just happened. He hadn't meant for it to go this far, but Henry was dead. The adrenaline still coursed through his veins. 
but the horror was already beginning to seep into his mind. Panic gripped Michael, but he knew he had to act quickly. First, he meticulously wiped his fingerprints from every surface he might have touched. Then, he erased all traces of the struggle. He decided to stage the scene as a suicide. He placed the flash drive back into Henry's pocket, then took Henry's gun from the dresser drawer and put it into the dead man's hand. Michael tried to make everything look as natural and convincing as possible, as if Henry had succumbed to the pressure and taken his own life. But even after setting the scene, Michael couldn't shake the feeling that someone would still suspect something. What worried him most, however, was the content of the flash drive. He knew it could be the key to uncovering what Henry had been involved in, but it could also become his own death sentence if the criminal syndicate Henry was tied to found out the flash drive was now in his possession. Michael hid the flash drive in a secret spot, deciding that he needed to dispose of the body first. However, he couldn't begin to imagine the horrors that lay ahead that night. He knew only one thing, his life would never be the same. June 22, 2014. When the police arrived at the scene, Michael's initial story that Henry had fallen victim to a robbery raised suspicions among the detectives. The lead detective on the case was Sarah Hunt, who had previously worked with Henry in the police force. She immediately noticed several inconsistencies in what had occurred. Sarah's first doubts arose when she inspected the house. There were no signs of forced entry, all the valuables remained in place, and Henry was found in a position that seemed too carefully staged. Although Michael insisted it was an accidental death related to a robbery, Sarah couldn't help but notice that the scene looked as if it had been deliberately set up. Sarah also noticed the physical condition of Henry. Fresh bruises on his hands and neck didn't align with how he was supposed to have taken his own life. These were signs of a struggle, indicating that someone else might have been involved in his death. June 23, 2014. As the investigation continued, Sarah began examining Henry's personal belongings, trying to find any clues that could shed light on his final days. She discovered his journal hidden in one of the drawers. The entry seemed disjointed at first, but soon Sarah realized that they contained coded references to meetings with someone named Johnson. These entries made it clear to Sarah that Henry was more deeply involved in criminal activity than she had initially suspected. The journal mentioned numerous meetings with Johnson, who appeared to be a key figure in the shadowy dealings Henry was involved in. These records revealed a whole layer of criminal activity, including money laundering, blackmail, and possible murders. Sarah realized that Johnson might have been the person who forced Henry into hiding and living a double life. She speculated that these connections could have led to the tragic events that unfolded at the Sturt home. June 24, 2014. With each passing day, the investigation grew deeper. Detectives, including Sarah, began piecing together the events of that fateful evening. They noted the inconsistencies in Michael's story and quickly found new evidence linking him to the crime scene. One of the key pieces of evidence was the traces of his presence at the scene, which he had failed to erase. Forensic analysis found Michael's fingerprints on the weapon, completely disproving his story about Henry's suicide. Additionally, bloodstains were found in Michael's garage, which later turned out to belong to Henry, indicating an attempt to conceal the struggle. These findings led to Michael's arrest. He was taken into custody on suspicion of Henry's murder. Michael was stunned as the police handcuffed him and took him to the station for questioning. However, this was only the first step in uncovering the truth. At the same time, Sarah and her team began to suspect that Henry might not have been just a victim of a family dispute. They started digging deeper, trying to uncover the crimes that might have been hidden behind his double life and what impact they might have had on the unfolding events. The entire town was caught up in a scandal that promised to reveal shocking secrets from Henry's past. July 15, 2014. The trial of Michael Stewart began with palpable tension in the courtroom. The prosecution presented compelling evidence they had gathered over the past few months. One of the key moments was the introduction of Henry's flash drive, which had been found in Michael's pocket on the night of the murder. The prosecutor, confident in his case, started by showing the contents of the flash drive, which turned out to be a bombshell. It contained recordings of conversations and documents that confirmed Henry's involvement in corruption schemes tied to high-ranking politicians and businessmen in the city of Riverdale. The revelation sent shockwaves through the courtroom, especially when it became clear that Henry wasn't just aware of these schemes but was actively involved in them, reaping huge financial rewards. The trial reached its climax with the appearance of an unexpected witness. Thomas Tommy Wilson, a former associate of Henry, who had also been involved in criminal activities. Thomas, having struck a deal with the prosecution, 
agreed to testify against Henry in exchange for a reduced sentence. In his testimony, Thomas revealed that Henry had planned to flee the country with stolen money that belonged to the Mafia. He confirmed that Henry felt the noose tightening around his neck and was planning to exit the game using the money to start a new life abroad. Thomas also claimed that Henry had been recording incriminating evidence against his associates for blackmail purposes, making him a very dangerous man to those he was involved with. These revelations completely changed the course of the case. It now became clear that Michael might have been caught up in a game he hadn't even known existed. Although Michael was charged with Henry's murder, his actions began to appear as a desperate act of self-defense against a man who had led a double life and could have posed a threat to his family. August 5, 2014. After weeks of intense trial proceedings and deliberations, the jury reached a verdict. Michael was found guilty of murder, but the judge, considering the new circumstances, decided to show leniency in sentencing. During the sentencing, the judge noted that while Michael's actions were criminal, they might have been driven by fear for his life and the lives of his family. He was sentenced to prison with the possibility of parole after 10 years. Meanwhile, the Riverdale police did not halt their investigation. Henry's case was only the tip of the iceberg. Now, with new evidence and testimonies, the police set their sights on uncovering the entire criminal syndicate that Henry had been a part of. Detective Sarah Hunt, who had played a key role in unraveling this network, took on the task of continuing the investigation to put an end to this criminal nightmare. In 2014, after the trial, Jessica decided to sever all ties with her past life. She filed for divorce and made plans to leave Riverdale with her children, hoping to start fresh in another town. But despite her efforts to leave it all behind, the shadows of the past continued to haunt her. A few weeks after moving, Jessica received a letter from an unknown sender. The letter contained thinly veiled threats and hints that she might also be implicated in Henry's case. The fear that her new life would not be peaceful began to seep into her mind. The secret life of Henry continued to weigh on her, and she couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching her every move. On September 1, 2014, the town of Riverdale was left reeling from everything that had happened. The Sturt House had become a symbol of destruction, tragedy, and the dark secrets that had been hidden behind a facade of respectability. Rumors began to spread among the townspeople that the house was cursed. No one wanted to remember what had once seemed like a normal life but had now become a nightmare for everyone associated with the place. People started avoiding any discussion of the case, fearing that even mentioning it could draw the attention of the criminal elements that had infiltrated the very core of their community. By October 15, 2014, Jessica had moved to a small town, hoping that she could forget the past, but her hopes for a peaceful life quickly crumbled. Strange calls began coming to her cell phone. A mysterious voice on the other end reminded her that Henry's case was far from closed. She was haunted by threats and hints that her new life could also be destroyed if she didn't keep quiet. Jessica realized that the past would never let her go. She understood that Henry's shadows would follow her for the rest of her life and that she would forever be tied to the tragedy that had begun in Riverdale. Subscribe for more fictional crime stories.